Well, last week we finished the second missionary journey of Paul. And we've seen that he continues to have success, but also to face opposition as we will when we are carrying the message of the gospel. You remember last week the Bereans were committed for their diligent study of the Word of God, the fact that they didn't just take what Paul said, but they would look into Scripture, examine Scripture, and make sure that what he was teaching lined up with Scripture. In in Corinth, we saw that Paul uh, picked up two friends, Priscilla and Aquila, to help with the work. You remember the Athenians? uh, In Acts 17, 21, it said that the Athenians and the foreigners who lived among them spent all of their time talking about or or listening to, to anything that was new. Why? They had all these gods but they were listening for the next new thing because their gods did not satisfy them. So you think about applications we covered last week. Let me just mention a couple of those that we covered. One was the idea of constantly looking for ripe or low-hanging fruit. Paul always started in the synagogue because there were people there who were searching, people who were open to the truth. And there are people around us every day who are searching and open to the truth. We just need to pray that God gives us spiritual eyes to see who they are. And the, the other thing we talked about last week was Paul being provoked. You remember that when he went to Athens, he was provoked. He was literally sick to his stomach over the deception that he saw there and the foothold that Satan had on that city. We talked about the need for us today to be provoked about the losses around us. You know, many of you um, pray for me regularly. Some of you I hear and get notes from. Let me just say, if you're going to pray anything for your pastor, you need to pray that he'll be provoked that he'll be disturbed deeply in his soul and his spirit over the losses of people that live around us. Now, I want you to pray that I'll be provoked, but please don't go around telling people my pastor is always provoked, okay? Don't do that. That that really doesn't play well. All right, we're going to pick up in in, uh, verse 23 of chapter 18 as Paul is beginning his third journey. Paul stayed in Antioch. There's some debate somewhere between a year, maybe, maybe two years there in Antioch. You remember that was kind of home base. He went back to retool to be refreshed, I'm sure, to receive uh, encouragement from the brothers. Paul goes through a lot on these journeys that, that literally uh, drains him physically and, and somewhat spiritually and emotionally and mentally. So I'm sure some of that time in Antioch of refreshment was also a time to receive encouragement. And, and I thought about this week as I was studying back through this passage again and thought about how important it is to encourage those who are out on the front lines. And I want to ask you to help me encourage some of our frontline folks. On the back of your bulletin, uh, in what is typically your note space, you see a list of four international missionaries and six church planters. These are people that we are involved with in their work, either through support or sending teams in a a variety of ways. And I thought it'd be really neat this week if these 10 folks got several, nothing lengthy, just several short uh, notes of encouragement. You see their email addresses. Let me mention those who are international missionaries don't use the word missionary. Uh, some, of them are in, some of them are in restricted places. It's good not to even use things we normally do, like don't say, I'm praying for you. Say things like, hey, I talked to dad about you today. Hey, I appreciate the work that you're doing in, in telling people about dad. You can say those kind of things. Just a couple of lines. The church planters are all guys from here in Little Rock all the way to, uh, to Las Vegas, Colorado, Oregon. We have a team in Oregon right now working with, uh, with Josh Carter. But those are guys that you can just send a note to, hey, I'm thankful for what you're doing to advance the gospel. I want you to know that I'm praying for you today. But let's take some time this week. If you can do more than one, great. If you can do all ten, great. But just send a note or two, just a sentence or two of encouragement to these folks that are on the front lines. All right, Paul begins um, the third journey doing what he always does. He retraces his route through Galatia and Phrygia, again, encouraging and strengthening those churches. You remember that at the end of the second journey last week, on his way, a brief stop in Ephesians, they asked Paul if he would stay, and he said he couldn't. But you remember he said this, I will come back if the Lord wills. You know, in in Paul's ministry, in in all of Paul's journey, you see him place that condition a lot. He said it to the Ephesians. He said it to the Romans. He said it to the Philippians and to the Corinthians. Paul believed that the God he trusted to bring him to faith was a God he would trust to send him wherever he needed to proclaim the faith. And all of of Paul's life, his, his service, how he lived, where he traveled, all of that was directed by God. Waiting on God and and seeking God's direction uh, for Paul was a very simple principle that he practiced. 
He didn't do anything without direction from the Lord. And, and that principle comes from two very familiar Old Testament passages. Let me mention those very quick. In Psalm 37, 5, the psalmist said, commit your way to the Lord, trust in him, and he will bring it to pass. You see, if you have committed yourself and the course and direction of your life to the Lord, then what happens in your life will be what he made happen and what he wanted to happen. It's a lot easier to not have to question steps that you're taking, decisions you're making, if you're daily committing yourself on your way to the Lord and letting him direct, then what happens is going to be what he directed, what he caused to happen. And then also in, in Proverbs chapter 3, verse 5, that's probably a very familiar passage to most of us, 3, 5, and 6, trust in the Lord with all your heart, lean not on your own understanding. Verse 6, in all your ways, acknowledge him and he will direct your path. Again, when you're, when you're surrendered and you've committed yourself to the Lord and you're letting him control, you're obeying, you're following his lead, you're going to end up right where he wants you. And amazingly, you're also going to end up right where you want to be. You may not realize that, but when you're in the will of the Lord, when you're surrendered to his way, where you end up is going to be a place of incredible purpose and fulfillment. And while it may not have been the place that you dreamed you would end up, when you get there, you're going to say, you know what, this is exactly where I need to be. Paul's principle for life and ministry was to let the Spirit guide him and direct him. Now, Paul has traveled through Galatia. Virgia, after strengthening those churches, he's headed to Ephesus. You remember that on that last journey, he didn't stay long, but he left uh, Priscilla and Aquila there. But before Paul arrives, we've got this little uh, section in, in, at the end of chapter 18. Before he arrives, Luke records what's happening in Ephesus through a Jew named Apollos. Apollos is a native of Alexandria. Uh, he is a Jew, and he is preaching in Ephesus. Look in chapter 18, verses 24 to 26. Now a Jew named Apollos, a native of Alexandria, came to Ephesus. He was an eloquent man, competent in the scriptures. He had been instructed in the way of the Lord, and being fervent in spirit, he spoke and taught accurately the things concerning Jesus, though he knew only the baptism of John. He began to speak boldly in the synagogue, but when Priscilla and Aquila heard him, they took him aside and explained to him the way of God more accurately. Now, Apollos evidently is an incredible communicator. He's eloquent, he, he's smooth, he's fluid. You see there it says he's competent in scriptures. Really the word is mighty. The Greek word um, that, we, that we would get mighty from is dunatos, which you recognize is where we get our word dynamite. Apollos was powerful in the way he handled scripture. Now understand when it says he was competent in scriptures, all he had was the Old Testament. But he knew the Old Testament scripture thoroughly. You know, when I read that Apollos was competent or mighty in Scripture, I had to ask myself, am I mighty in Scripture? You know, it's very costly. It's a costly commitment to be competent with Scripture, with the Word of God. But when you think about the Word of God as something that Scripture says will last into eternity, it's certainly a worthwhile investment to spend great time in the Word of God. Verse 25 says he was instructed in the way of the Lord. Literally, that means he was catechized. He went through catechism. He was taught the things of the Lord orally and through repetition. And I say that this morning to say to you as parents, when your children are young, it is good to repeat and to teach and to repeat and to go over the things of the Lord and specifically Scripture, to memorize Scripture with them. That's how Apollos learned all that he knew of Scripture is that he'd been taught that orally and it had been repeated over and over. And then it says in verse 25, he taught accurately. In other words, he was very careful with how he handled the truth. But there was a problem. He had accurate information, but his information wasn't complete. You see this phrase, he knew only the baptism of John. Well, what does that mean? Well, first of all, we need to understand baptism was not strictly a, a Christian concept. There were other uh, religions, other um, groups that use baptism. In fact, the Jews used baptism. When a Gentile proselyte came to Judaism, baptism was used as a ritual cleansing. It didn't, didn't mean to them what it means to us today. Well, John literally was the last Old Testament prophet. You say, well, how's that? He's in the New Testament. Well, he's the last Old Testament prophet. He's the last prophet before the coming of Messiah. And what John did, if you read in the Gospels about John, what John did is he called people to repentance in preparation for the Messiah to come. So literally, when a person was baptized by John, what were they doing? They were demonstrating that they recognized they were a sinner. They were demonstrating they wanted to repent or, or to be cleansed. And they were demonstrating 
that they were committed to following the law of God until Messiah came. Now, being committed to following the law of God also meant they had to keep on sacrificing because until Jesus came, sins were only covered for by the blood of those sacrificial animals. Now, when Jesus came, obviously that was no longer necessary. He was the perfect sacrifice. But when Jesus came, it also meant you could no longer count on the law in order to make you pleasing uh, to God or, or be made right with God. Now, what does baptism mean for us? Well, for us today, being baptized as a Christian still symbolizes repentance. It still symbolizes cleansing, and it symbolizes a, a commitment. It's not the thing that saves us. It wasn't the thing that saved them either. But it's different to us today in that besides meaning what it meant as far as repentance and cleansing, baptism today symbolizes what has happened in our life, not what we're looking forward to. They were baptized because they were looking forward to the coming of Messiah. We're baptized because he has come. We're identified when, when someone is baptized. By the way, in, in the venue this morning, they had two that came for baptism. That's an important thing to do after you've come to faith in Christ. And baptism, you've seen the picture of it. It's a symbol of the death and burial and resurrection of Christ, and it identifies us with him in his death and burial and resurrection. And what is it? It's a commitment. It's identifying our commitment to Christ. So we have made the decision to, to by faith, uh, accept him and to be saved. We've also made the decision to be obedient and to follow him. And I'm going to tell you, following Christ, being obedient to Christ, is a greater challenge than being obedient to the law. The law was never meant to save us. We could not fulfill the law. We could not keep the law. But Jesus goes even above and beyond the law in what he calls us to do. Well, all Apollos understood was the baptism of John, the baptism of repentance, of looking forward to Messiah. And he's speaking boldly in the synagogue, and he's accurate in how he handles the Old Testament, but his witness or his message is incomplete. So what happens? You saw in the text, in verse 26, it says, When Priscilla and Aquila heard him, they took him aside and explained to him the way of God more accurately. Well, it's a good thing there wasn't social media back then. Priscilla and Aquila might have been tempted to blog about him or to call him out on Facebook or say something negative about him on Instagram. They didn't do that. They saw that this man was sincere, and they privately, they pull him aside, they invite him into their home, they correct him, they explain, they help him know the complete message. Apollos believes he receives the Messiah that he'd been waiting, that had already come. He receives the Messiah. He becomes a powerful witness for the gospel of Christ. And in fact, you see that he is sent to Achaia where Corinth is, and he's a tremendous help to the church there. Now, let's pick back up with Paul in chapter 19, verses 1 through 7. And it happened that while Apollos was at Corinth, Paul passed through the inland country and came to Ephesus. There he found some disciples. And he said to them, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? And they said, no, we have not even heard that there is a Holy Spirit. And he said, into what then were you baptized? They said, into John's baptism. And Paul said, John baptized with the baptism of repentance, telling the people to believe in the one who is to come after him, that is Jesus. On hearing this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus, and when Paul had laid his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came on them, and they began speaking in tongues and prophesying. There were about 12 men at all. Well, Paul found some disciples. We, we automatically assume that the word disciple means that they were Christians or Christ followers. That's what we take it to mean in our day. But it says that Paul found some disciples, and he asked them what happened specifically had they received the Holy Spirit, and they had not. Now, recognize the word disciple simply means a, a learner or a taught one. The question would be, of whom are you a disciple? That's what makes the difference. It, it matters, it's vital uh, what, what you believe. What did they believe? They weren't yet disciples of, of Christ. Like Paul, evidently, they had not yet heard that Messiah had come, and they would not placed their faith in him. So Paul explains that to them. They come to faith, they're baptized, they receive the Holy Spirit. Now, don't get hung up on the fact that, that Paul laid hands on them for them to receive the Holy Spirit. Weeks ago, when we started the study in Acts, we mentioned that what's happening in Acts is, is it's a formative and transitional time in the church. It's not the norm. The normative from, from Acts on, the normative that you see all through the New Testament, what God's Word tells us is that people who receive Christ receive the Holy Spirit at the point, at the moment of salvation. Let me say that again. 
because there's some different teaching even today. People who receive Christ according to the Word of God, people who receive Christ at the moment of salvation receive the Holy Spirit. People who receive Christ also most often typically are baptized immediately after salvation. If you've come to Christ and you've not been baptized, are you saved? Yes, but you're in disobedience. Christ said that when we we accept him, and you see this throughout the New Testament and Scripture, when we receive Christ, we're to be baptized and baptized by immersion. Okay, if you were sprinkled as a child or had some other experience of baptism, you were not baptized by immersion following salvation, then your baptism is not biblical. I tell people this all the time. I'll say it next week in our Discover class. We baptize by immersion, not because we're a Baptist church, but because we're a New Testament church. That's what Scripture tells us to do. People who come to Christ at the moment of salvation receive the Holy Spirit and typically are baptized immediately after salvation. If you need help getting that taken care of, any of our pastors would be glad to help and talk with you about that. Well, Paul asked them specifically in their experience, he asked them about the Holy Spirit. Why? Because the Holy Spirit is the evidence that a person knows Christ. Twelve men, these twelve men didn't have the Holy Spirit because they didn't know Christ. So what's your experience with the Spirit and with baptism? Paul in 2 Corinthians 5, 17 said, If any man is in Christ, he is a new creature or a new creation. You have to be in Christ, and Christ has to be in you if you belong to him. Well, well, how does that happen? The Holy Spirit. That's how Christ is in you. If you're saved, you have the Holy Spirit living in you, and you should know that. You should know the Spirit. You should know the Spirit because daily you hear His voice. Now listen, I'm not talking about something magical or or mystical. There are times that the Spirit speaks incredible things into a person and supernatural events occur. But I'm just talking about if you belong to Christ as a daily experience, you ought to hear the Holy Spirit giving direction to your life. Last Sunday, some some of you know I had to trade vehicles with my daughter last week. She has a purple Jeep. (laughs) I can't tell you the kind of grief I got out of the staff here last week. So last Sunday, I had some things to do. I had a meeting with Jason, some other things. But at 1230, I was still up in my office looking out the window waiting for the parking lot to clear so I could go get in the purple Jeep and go home. (laughs) Just being honest. Holy Spirit spoke to me last Sunday. He mentioned to me that there was a man in in rehab at Baptist that I needed to go see. This guy's not even a church member. His wife attends occasionally, I think. And I said, Lord, it's nearly one o'clock. I'm hungry. I'm tired. Y'all know I've been driving back and forth to Texas constantly, right? I'm tired i got to be back at this church at 4 o'clock today. It's 25 minutes to the house. You want me to do what? Now, there are a lot of times I have to turn around and go back. This time I didn't. I got in my purple Jeep, ducked down as best I could, drove over to Baptist Rehab, saw this man. Let me tell you what happened. I didn't get but a couple of minutes with him because he was about to go into a a therapy session. But as I was getting ready to leave, I told the wife, I said, hey, just keep us updated We'll be checking on you. One of our pastors will be here every day checking on you guys, making sure your needs are taken care of. She looked at me. She said, wow, are you serious? Let me tell you something. We're going to get that family connected, and we're going to get them actively involved, not because I'm a great pastor because I went reluctantly to make a visit, but simply because I obeyed a simple instruction of the Holy Spirit, and I'm not super spiritual, and I'm not, I'm not any more tuned into the Spirit than you are. I'm just telling you, if you're a child of God and you listen daily, even in small ways like that, the Spirit will give you direction, do phenomenal things through you because you're hearing His voice. If you don't hear His voice, either you're not His, if you don't have the Spirit, you don't have Christ, either you're not His or there's some sin in your life, or there's been too many times you said no, or no, not now, and and your hearing has gotten damaged. The good news is that damage is certainly 
reversible. If we know Christ, we have the Spirit, we need to listen to what he tells us, the instruction he gives us in our life. Chapter 19, verses 8 through 10. He entered the synagogue. He's there at Ephesus. He entered the synagogue, and for three months he spoke boldly, reasoning and persuading them about the kingdom of God. But when some became stubborn and continued in unbelief, speaking evil of the way before the congregation, he withdrew from them and took the disciples with him, reasoning daily in the hall of Tyrannus. This continued for two years so that all the residents of Asia heard the word of the Lord, both Jews and Greeks. Now, remember, they asked him to come. Last visit, hey, would you, would you stay? Would you come back? Would you teach? They asked him to, and it took a little longer here in Ephesus than in some of the other cities and synagogues, but once again, the Jews eventually turned on him. But you notice Paul didn't quit. He just found a, a place, a hall of Tyrannus. It was just a place for discussion and debates, and he went there, and he stayed there, and it says for two years he continued teaching. Look at verse 10 again so that all the residents of Asia heard the word of the Lord, both Jews and Greeks. Isn't that phenomenal? Because of Paul's obedience, in, in, in spite of opposition, because of Paul's faithfulness, literally everyone in Asia had the opportunity to hear the gospel of Christ. Verses 11 and 12. And God was doing extraordinary miracles by the hands of Paul so that even handkerchiefs or aprons that had touched his skin were carried away to the sick and their diseases left them and the evil spirits came out of them. Well, what's happening? Paul's proclaiming the gospel and the Lord is confirming it through miracles. Now, this is not something we haven't seen before. We know all through the, the gospels of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, Jesus was uh, his message was authenticated, who he was was authenticated, that he was Messiah by what? By miracles. Through the latter part of the Gospels and into Acts, we see the apostles performing miracles that authenticated the Gospel message. Miracles still happen today, not on the level we see here. Miracles still happen today only when they bring glory to God. Let me tell you, the stuff that you see on TV, the miracles and stuff you see on TV that draw the attention and the focus to a man, those are not of God. Those are not supernatural miracles that God has performed. God only performs miracles to authenticate the gospel and to draw people to himself and to glorify himself. Well, how's the gospel authenticated today? How's the message authenticated today? Very simple. Any man that you hear preaching a message, his message is authentic if it lines up with this book. Only if it lines up with this book. You need to carefully, as we discussed last week with the Bereans, examine the Scripture and take what you hear and look at it against this book. The reason I had miracles back then is you couldn't hear a, a man uh, preach the gospel and say, well, <clears throat> what he's saying uh, contradicts Scripture. They didn't have the Scripture like we do today. A supernatural work was the only way that they could authenticate and validate the, the message of the man. And so what you see in verse 12 is miracles are occurring through Paul. Now, the Ephesians are very superstitious people. Uh, they're involved in magic. They're involved in occultic practices. You see where it says the hand handkerchiefs or aprons that touch his skin? <clears throat> Literally, the literal translation of that, sweat rags. As Paul is walking around in, in that climate, in that heat, if he had a handkerchief or apron, not in the way that we think of apron ladies, a, a piece of cloth, and he would use it to mop his brow, to mop the sweat. They would get those sweat rags and carry them to people who were sick, and they would be healed, and the evil spirits would come out of them. Now, Paul is not one to rob glory from God. Paul's not going around pretending like he has all the power, but God, in spite of their uh, misguided, misplaced belief, God still went ahead and healed people and, and, and freed them from evil spirits. And I kind of laughed when I read that about the sweat rags. I laughed about, <coughs> excuse me, the charlatans today who do that very thing. Several years ago, when Pastor Jason and I were both student pastors here, we had an intern named Bart Patton that some of you might remember. And Bart was a little bit of a prankster. And Bart started signing me up um, to all these preacher types who would send out uh, cloth or this and that. They'd send it to you in the mail, and if you made a certain donation, the power, you know, you know what I'm talking about, right? Well, I started getting all these little scraps of material in the mail. 
I'd throw them in the trash. Pretty soon I'd get these nasty letters because they hadn't received a gift from me. One time I got in the mail. It was um, to help my finances, which, which could have used some help. Um, this little thing cut out in the shape of a dollar, the dollar sign. And it said that if you gave X amount of gift... Um, God was going to greatly increase your finances. In fact, you could throw this little, it, it wasn't much thicker than a piece of paper. If you threw this thing in a bowl of water, you would see it expand, and you would see that exponentially your finances were going to expand. I, I threw it in the water. <laughs> I didn't send a gift. It was just a super compressed sponge, so it expanded in the water. Isn't that sad that people fall for that stuff? I can't tell you how many little scraps of cloth I got. I never tried to even use any of them, but how ridiculous that people do things like that to fleece the flock of God. Listen, Paul knew, and we know, the power is not in the cloth. The power is not in the man. The power is God's power. Paul, Paul is giving the message, and God is confirming it with power. So you know what happens next. Here comes Satan. Satan. All this miraculous stuff is happening. People are responding to the gospel. So here comes Satan with the counterfeit. Look in verses 13 through 16. Then some of the itinerant Jewish exorcists undertook to invoke the name of the Lord Jesus over those who had evil spirits, saying, I adjure you by the Jesus whom Paul proclaims. Now, right there you got a problem. They're trying to cast out evil spirits by a name they don't know. I adjure you by the name of Jesus whom Paul proclaims. Seven sons of a Jewish high priest named Sveca were doing this, but the evil spirit answered them, Jesus I know, Paul I recognize, but who are you? I love this next part. He kicked, I can't say that word in here, they're children. And the man in whom was the evil spirit leaped on them, mastered all of them. There's seven of them, mastered all of them, overpowered them, so they fled out of the house naked and wounded. How's that, big boy? Isn't that great? Now, I tell you, clearly we need to understand that Satan has tremendous power, but we know that Jesus is more powerful. What, what was the problem here? Well, these guys, it's not unusual for, for Jewish priests to try to cast out demons. That's not unusual at all. But to use the name of Jesus... Listen, the Jewish priests didn't know him. They didn't even believe in him. They just saw this as a new gimmick that they could use. Had this scheme worked, it would have discredited the gospel, the name of Jesus, the, the, the church in Ephesus. You know, what Satan tries to do is he, he always attempts to imitate the work of God so that he can confuse those who are unsaved. He tries to imitate the work of God so he can cause doubts about God, so he can cloud the message, ensure that people don't hear the message. Jesus is not an amulet. He's not a, a good luck charm. We need to be careful how we use the name of Jesus. In verses 17 through 20, we, we saw that God defeated Satan, verse 17, and this became known to all the residents of Ephesus, both Jews and Greeks, and the fear fell on them all, and the name of the Lord Jesus was extolled or lifted up. Now look at this. And many of those who were now believers came confessing and divulging their practices. And a number of those who had practiced magic arts brought their books together and burned them in the sight of all, and they counted the value of them and found it came to 50,000 pieces of silver. So the word of the Lord continued to increase and prevail mightily. God not only defeated Satan's scheme, but he brought conviction on new believers who were still practicing the magic arts. They were still using demonic powers. They were believers in Christ, but they were still doing uh, these evil things. And what happened was the name of Jesus was lifted up. The veracity and the power of the gospel message was made very clear. Look at this. They, they destroyed all of their books, all of their, their, their sorcery, 50,000 pieces of silver. A piece of silver back then was typically a drachma. A drachma was basically one day's wages. So what they destroyed was equivalent to 50,000 days wages. If you worked seven days a week, it would take you 137 years to work 50,000 days. That was the value of what they destroyed. Now, you, you might wonder, 
okay, if they were believers, why were they still involved in, in, in these evil practices? Listen, well, so when you come to Christ, salvation is instantaneous. Justification is instantaneous. The minute you come to Christ, you are justified, you are made right with God. But the change that needs to occur in your life, sanctification, may take some time. I mean, you hear people who have, have habits that they shouldn't have, and they come to Christ, and immediately they, they no longer have that, that desire, but there are others that it takes some time for that sanctification process to occur. Why? It's a process of discipleship. It's a process of learning. It's a process of coming to understand the Scripture and how God has called us to live. But, but let me say this. There's some people who who, who say, well, it's just taking me a little bit longer. They're simply not obeying the truth. When you're confronted with truth, if you're a believer, and maybe there's something in your life that you didn't realize is displeasing to God, when you're confronted with truth, your response should be immediate. If you've really been justified, then your heart should be that you want to be sanctified. You want to be made more like Christ. That's what happened with these Ephesians. They had trusted Christ for salvation. Then they're confronted with their sinful behavior, and they're willing to do whatever is necessary to be obedient. They made a huge financial sacrifice here. You know what happened? They came to the realization that, that the value of what we're holding on to is less than nothing compared to the value of a deeper, more intimate walk with Christ. Let me say that again, because all of us have some things that we hold on to that are not pleasing to God. Think about this. Think about what that is in your life. The value of what you're holding on to is worth less than nothing compared to the value of a deeper, more intimate walk with Christ. And they were willing to obey and to give up and do whatever it took to be more obedient to Christ. Well, what have we, what have we got this morning? What are some of the points of, of application that we could see from, from this first part of Paul's third journey that would apply to our lives? The first thing is that, that we said that Paul was very careful to depend on the Lord's direction for every aspect of life, everything that he did. And, and when we're surrendered and we're completely obedient to the leadership of the Holy Spirit in, in whatever he calls us to do, we're going to be in the right place and we're going to be going the right direction. And there's tremendous purpose and, and fulfillment in that when we're fully under the control of the Spirit of God. The second thing we saw today related to the Spirit is the Spirit is evidence of salvation. If we're in Christ, we have the Spirit. And if we listen to the Spirit, he will speak, he will direct, and even the simple things of life. If we're not hearing the Spirit, either we're not in Christ or there's a sin problem, a failure to obey that has made it difficult for us to hear. But that can easily be corrected. And then lastly, we saw there in Ephesus, the name of Jesus has great power to those who know him. But listen, he's not a good luck charm. Don't expect, if you're not walking with Jesus and you're not obeying Jesus, you're not living for Jesus, don't expect to be able to throw up that prayer before a test, or before a business deal and say, well, Jesus, bless me. Be my good luck charm here. You know, I know, I know people who aren't even believers, but because they know a believer, they think they're okay. That, that's their good luck charm. Jesus is not one that we bargain and make agreements with either. Hey, Jesus, if you'll do this for me, I'll follow you. No. The name of Jesus has incredible power for those who know him. Not know of him, not have heard his name, but who personally know him. What's your experience? When you trusted Christ, did you receive the Holy Spirit? Is he the one who directs your life and your steps each day? Do you hear him? He is the evidence. 